But later, not right now. So let's take a couple of seconds and prepare our, our hearts and our minds to worship our true God. <laughs> If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We're to look to heaven right now. That's not flashy. That's not going to win you the awards and the praise of your friends, but it's going to win you what is your true life. It's going to win you heaven itself. Let's come and begin by praising our God. Let me invite you to stand and sing our opening hymn. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. Page five in your bulletin or th number 38 in the red hymnal in front of you. You are invisible to us. We cannot see you and we cannot grapple with you, but you see us and you grapple with our hearts every day. Help us, therefore, to not put our trust in what our eyes can see, but put our trust in you, the maker of all good things, the one who has shown us what is true and what is good. In your very word we come. Ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. So be seated. We continue our New Testament reading through the short, but nonetheless important, second letter of John. Second John will begin in verse 8. We'll read through verse 11. You'll recall last time John warned us about those who deceive, those who go out in the world. And he says, now, what are we to do about that? Beginning in verse 8, let me ask you to follow along with your hearts as well as your eyes. John and the Lord say this, Watch yourselves, so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Let's the reading of God's Word. What do we have here? 
we have a very simple statement that you need to watch yourself. There's a watching that goes on in the Christian life. You need to watch not just Jesus, but you need to watch yourself. How do you do that? Well, you watch yourself by watching others. That's what he said. You watch yourself by watching the teaching, by listening to the teaching, by hearing the teaching. Is the teaching of Christ what you're living in? Are you trying to get better than Jesus? That's the import here, right? Are you trying to be smarter than Jesus, wiser than Jesus, better than Jesus? We saw this morning in the book of Acts, that was the issue. Those in Jerusalem were assuming that you had to be, yes, a Christian, but also circumcised. And you and I do the very same thing. We can be better than Jesus, holier than Jesus. And that is going to lead us into wicked works. So let us watch ourselves. And part of watching ourselves is coming to God and seeking His Word on our lives. We do that this evening by confessing together what you have in your bulletin, this confession of sin from the Book of Common Prayer. So let me invite you to confess along with me what really you are, and I am, what we have done before God. So let's join together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against You in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved You with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of Your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in Your will and walk in Your ways to the glory of Your name. Amen. Let me ask that you stand now as we hear God respond to our confession of sin. You've confessed your sin. You've done that as a Christian. What does God say about you? What does God say to you, the sinner? He says this from Isaiah 12. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. You are not your salvation, Christian. Your faith is not your salvation. Your goodness is not your salvation. Jesus Christ is your salvation. If you look to Him, you are free. You are saved. Though you have sinned against God, though you've sinned against your neighbor, you are in Him delivered. You're not unclean, as we heard this morning. You're clean in Him. Rest in that truth. May that be your strength, but also your song. May that be your strength, and may that be your song. So let's make it our strength as we confess our faith using those words that Christians have used for centuries, millennia even. The words of the Apostles' Creed. Dear Christian, you'll find them at the top of page 3. Dear Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. My well, friends, let's turn to page 6 in our bulletin to sing Psalm 77.
Let's go to our God in His wonders and His acts. Let's go to His kindness and His great joy in prayer. (coughs) Let us pray. Almighty God, Lord of the armies, You are a God whose power never ceases to work. Your arm is not too short to save, and yet You can feel so far off. Like the psalmist, we can ask, have you forgotten to be kind? Have you remembered your wrath against us? Have you abandoned us? Have you changed who you are? Have you ceased to be the mighty yet merciful maker? And yet, Lord, we come to you banking on the fact that you have stayed the same, that you, the Lord, do not change, that there is no shadow of turning. You're not always trying to turn around and find everything. But, Lord, you stay the same yesterday and today and forever, every day. You remain that merciful God who looks upon the woes of your people, who hears our despairs. You hearken to our cries. You come and you hold our tears in your bottle. And we pray, Lord, if those who have suffered greatly over these past months, the past year, or those who have been wounded and weak, those who have been afflicted and smitten and stricken by plague, by disease, by self, by loss of a job, by loss of family, by loss of friends. Lord, we come with those who need not just healing, not just emotional strength, not just mental fortitude, but we need, Lord, Your cleaning work, Your Spirit that cleans us up, Your Spirit that makes us whole. Help us, we pray, as the pitiful souls we are, to come to You and run to You and cling to Your precious bleeding side. Father, we ask, yes, that you would forgive us for our sins, but we ask more that you would help us to be more like our Savior. And so it's in that vein that we do pray, asking you to help us plumb the depth of what it means that Christ is the great bridegroom that He is the one who lavishes His love upon His bride, the church, and He washes her with water and the Word. And Lord, you, You've given us in, our, in Your kindness two pictures of that this week. We pray for the weddings of Hannah Pulliam. We pray for the, the wedding of Rebecca Hart. We ask that You would give them comfort in the days ahead. We ask that You would give them confidence that the men You brought into our lives, You brought for this very reason to be their bridegroom to wed them as Christ weds His church, to wash them with the Word as Christ washes us with His Word. So we pray that You would produce not just godly offspring, certainly we pray for that, but we pray that You would produce godly fruit in their marriages. They would be like those oak trees planted by the streams of water, not like the wicked, not like the chaff that blows away, but they would be those that stand firm in the days of trial, those who have fruit, not just one month out of the year, but every month, all the time. Every day is fruit day for them, the fruit of love and joy, the fruit of patience and perseverance, the fruit of kindness, the fruit of gentleness and self-control, the fruit that perseveres through the long haul. We pray. We pray for Hannah. We pray for Rebecca. We pray for the new families that, that, that they will make, asking that you will be with them. We thank you for their having blessed us in their time with us. We pray not just for them, not just for ourselves. We pray for those that we consider to be unclean, that you would show us that in your sight, all those made in your image are clean, that in your church, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, When the Holy Spirit baptizes your people by faith, there is no unclean. There's only clean. Help us, Lord, to be those grace-filled people. Full of your love and the good works you've prepared beforehand for us to walk in. As we speak to one another, as we speak to our neighbors, as we seek to love them well, May we do so, and may you build your church that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We ask these things, O Lord. Thanking you once more, as we did did this morning, thanking you for those who have 
given their very lives that we might be here. Not afraid of folks coming in and busting up a meeting, busting up the worship of your people. But we are able to meet together freely, without fear, without alarm. And so, Lord, we ask that we would look at that freedom and see in it the greater freedom that you bring because of your great sacrifice, the once-for-all atonement on the cross of Jesus Christ, as he gave up his very lifeblood, that we vile wretches might live and have life everlasting and be a fountain of pure water that flows from the heart evermore. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let me invite you to turn in your copy of the Word to 2 Kings chapter 6. As I was thinking about the title for this, uh, this sermon, of course, I had to think of the great movie and soundtrack from the uh, musician Vangelist, 80s movie, Chair to Fire, great movie, you should watch it. It even has uh, a Presbyterian in it, so I'm told. But uh, excellent movie, um, great soundtrack. But we come to the real chariots of fire. We come to the real, uh, the reality behind that, uh, that movie's title this evening. But we come first to um, one of the <clears throat> most trivial miracles of Elisha. We come to two miracles of th this, uh, this, this evening, a trivial one and a big one. You recall last time we talked about Gehazi and Gehazi's issues and uh, how he went out from the presence of Elisha like a leper. And tonight we come to an axe head that floats and chariots of fire that appear. So let's come to God's Word. Let's read it and receive it and hear it not just as an interesting story or a weird tale, but as what it actually is, the Word of God in our life. 2 Kings chapter 6. We'll begin in verse 1. We'll read all the way through verse 2. 23. The author of Kings and God said these words. Now, the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, Look, the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan, and each of us there get a log, and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And he answered, Go. Then one of them said, Be pleased to go with your servants. And Elisha answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water. And he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And Elisha said, Take it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. Once, when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants, saying, at such a, at, at such a, In such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him, so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing, and he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, oh, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. It was told him, Behold, he is in Dothan. So he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, look, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Elisha said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, Please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, 
Please strike this people with blindness. So God struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, This is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. As soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and look, they were in the middle of Samaria. As soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? Elisha answered, You shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared for them a great feast, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. And the Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God does neither. It endures forever. Let us pray and ask his enduring word to endure powerfully in our time this evening. Let's pray. O oh Lord, help us to see the chariots and the horses of Israel, the chariots and the horses that are around us right now, the angels that are worshiping with us. May they guard us, and yet may they call us to faith, not to sight. For we ask this by faith in Jesus Christ, that you will do what we say, not because of our power, but because of your great promise, O oh great God. Amen. Of all the miracles of Elisha, the floating axe head's a weird one. Probably the weirdest one. I, I said that every week, and it gets stranger, I suppose. But let me, just, let me explain the miracle, first of all, just very basically. The miracle is a kind of strange one. Elisha throws a piece of wood. Wood floats, you know. And what happens? The metal axe head, the iron axe head, which does not float, iron, not float, it floats. So what is this? It's what the scholars call sympathetic miracles. In other words, Elisha throws wood that has the property of flotation. It floats into the water, and it makes the other object, the iron axe head, have the property of floating. It's miraculous. It doesn't happen normally. But that's the scientific, so-called, perspective on things. But that's not really the point, is it? So what actually is this miracle designed to show us? Well, it begins, the story does, with good news. You look at verse 1. The sons of the prophet say, we need a bigger place. The seminary is growing. Enrollment is booming. We need a campus, a real campus. And so the student body comes and they ask Elijah to build a bigger dorm. They say, let's go to Jordan. Let's all get a log. Let's build. Elisha says, okay, y'all go. Go. And Elisha, of course, believes in kind of hand-on training. I, I didn't do this in my seminary training. Maybe I should have. But uh, they go out there and they cut up wood. They chop timber. And they begin to make and to get the logs to build. Of course, there's an issue. The issue is this. You find it in verse 5. One of the guys is chopping at a log. His axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. Now, it helps to understand here that iron is very rare in those days. Iron objects were not uh, something you could find at Home Depot or Lowe's. An axe head was a rare and expensive tool. It cost many months of labor. You can imagine borrowing a table saw from your friend, and then watching it bounce off your pickup truck and land in a river. Actually, that's a bad comparison. Let me go one further. It's like borrowing the truck itself. And you find that as you're driving down that red Georgia clay dirt road, it's a muddy road, and you lose control of the steering wheel, and you flip that nice F-150 deep into the lake, and you can't get it out. You borrowed it. That's kind of what we have here. It's not just some tool, not just some axe. It is a precious object. And according to the law, according to the law of Moses, Exodus 22, verse 14, you can look there later, 
a borrower is responsible. If you borrow something, you have to restore it. If it's damaged, if you lose it, you have to restore it. So the guy sees the axe head. He sees the axe head come loose. He sees it flip into the water, and he thinks, oh, I already have a lot of student loans. What else can I take out to pay for this? You see, the answer is it's a big issue. And given the high cost of iron tools, that young man would have to sell himself into indentured servitude. It was, well, a possibility under the law of Moses. Debt slavery. And so this miracle, though it looks trivial at first, is actually not trivial at all. Whenever God performs a miracle, He's not just doing razzle-dazzle. He's not just doing magic for magic's sake. He's not just doing something that, that looks incredible to make you go, ooh, ah. There is a genuine need in this man's life for God's help. And God deploys His own divine resources to help this man. He deliberately does it. He brings it in a mighty, miraculous way. And He shows us, well, He shows us that what we may think is trivial is actually really important. The story of the axe head may seem trivial until the truck you borrow ends up at the bottom of the lake. It may seem trivial. Somebody else may have a big need, and you may think that's nothing until you have that need. This is one of the issues with, uh, with younger folks, right? You say, oh, I have to go to the hospital. I have to go to the doctor. And you're older, and you know that, that could be a very scary thing. For somebody who's younger, they may think, oh, okay, go to the doctor. I do that all the time. No big deal. It may seem trivial. It may seem trivial. Other people's needs may seem trivial, but yours seems life and death. You fall into debt. You lose some of my stuff. You head for financial ruin. That's a personal crisis that makes people soul sick, heart sick, worrying awake at night. And yet God knows exactly what his servants need, even this one young seminarian, son of the prophet. God loves to save you when you cry out for help. Whatever trials you face, it may seem tiny. Look, it's an axe head. It may seem tiny. It may be big for them. But here's the principle. God takes notice of your needs. God takes notice of your needs. No matter if you are overinflating them, which we can do, or whether you're underrating them, which we can do. You see, if we don't believe correctly about the floating axe head, we won't pray correctly to the, to the God that loves to take note even of how many hairs you have on your head, who loves to care even for the little sparrows that fall outside, even the goats, perhaps the peacock. I think that's the case. You see, God cares for each and every one of us and each and every one of our needs. And part of His great mercy is not blasting us for our misperceptions, not blasting us for saying, you think you have, a, you have a bad, you think you have this really bad need, you just need the gospel. You just need to, to remember that, well, just pray harder. You just need to remember that God's sovereign. And so stop crying about your issues. You just need to remember that God's working all things for your good and His glory, so you shouldn't have problems in life. You shouldn't really be praying your heart out. Oh, no, 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 no. God is working all things for his glory and your good, but he's doing it through your tears, through your cries, through the alas, my master, it was borrowed. Do you see the God you have? Heaven is his throne. The earth is his footstool. He loves to answer even your axe heady prayers. So are you praying? Are you praying your axe head to him? Are you bringing your needs to him? Are you saying, well, that's too trivial. That's too unimportant. Come to your God. Come to your God. You see, the return of the axe head here is a pointer to the way in which God's great redemption works. This axe head saves the man from slavery, debt slavery. But the gospel of Jesus Christ tells a better story, a bigger story of redemption. 
where Jesus' blood pays the infinite debt that slaves are owed, that we are owed, our sin is owed, and you are saved from slavery forever to sin, slavery to evil. And the same God who did the big salvation can do the tiny salvation in your life this very week. This is a God that is present. This is a God that is mighty in every crisis, in every emergency, only if you had that God. I mean, what, what kind of God would that be if, you, if we actually had Him as our God? You'd never stop praying to Him. You wouldn't stop trusting Him. He'd be doing all these things. So let's do it. Let's go to Him in prayer for these things. Let's seek Him as the axe head deliverer and the sin savior that He is. Both the mighty and the minute God cares about. But of course, that's not the major scene in this, in this little uh, two miracle story. The major scene that we'll spend more on, more time on this evening, is the blind given sight. The blind given sight. This chariot of fire episode. And this is anything but trivial. It's political. It's world-shaking. It's the story of Elisha at Dothan, where God delivered a, an army into the hands of a single prophet, where the entire Syria, Syrian special forces team was trying to hunt down not Osama bin Laden, but Elisha the prophet. One man trying to hunt him down. And you might think it's a story about war, but it's not. It's a story really about blindness and sight. We see three crucial principles in this little saga. We see first, everyone's blind. The first basic principle here is that everybody's blind. You have the scene set up for you. Verse 8, the king of Syria is warring against Israel. And they have these little raids into the land of Israel, sort of like, uh, well, the Middle East today. There's warfare going on. There's chaos going on. <coughs> Syrians go into Israel, they raid, they take prisoners, they burn villages, they kill people, they enslave. About as bad as the Vikings did, I suppose. They take the women away, the kids away as slaves. Awful people, not the kind of folks you want to have over for dinner. They murder, they pillage, they kill. Bad guys. And yet God keeps on saving Israel, rebellious Israel, idolatrous Israel. He keeps on saving them. He keeps on giving them the intelligence report from the king of Syria's you know, war chamber, his cabinet room. God keeps on using his bug in the ear of the king. And so the king of Syria is afraid, he's furious. He says, which one of y'all is the mole? Who's the traitor here? And one of his servants says, nobody's the traitor. Elisha's the problem. He's the prophet, verse 12. He's the prophet in Israel. He tells the king of Israel the words you speak in your bedroom. And so they send out a mighty army to try to capture. They surround the whole city of Dothan just to get one guy. There are mountains all around it. They surround it. They're waiting for the sun to come up. They can go in and attack and find the right guy. And they think, if we can just get this prophet who keeps telling the Israelites where we're going to be, <coughs> we can defeat this God of Israel. We can defeat this little podunk regional God and defeat the people and take them over. It'll be great. These are bad people, and yet they're blind to the chariots of fire. And then, there, then there's a servant of Elisha, verse 15. All right, the servant of the man of God rises up early in the morning. He sees an army with horses and chariots. What's his response? <coughs> he sees the Syrian army. He sees all the Delta Force teams there. He says, alas, my master, what shall we do? He's the servant of God, the seminarian, the good guy. The upstanding man, the guy who's trained all his life for the ministry, the outwardly person, outwardly good person, he's also blind. You see here that the, that the author of Kings puts together these two people, these two groups, the baddest of the bad, murderers, looters, and the nicest, sweetest, most wonderful servant. And they're both spiritually blind. That's the first point. Right? They're both spiritually blind. Elisha has to pray for both of them. He has to pray. Verse 17, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. My servant isn't seeing. He's not seeing. They don't understand. They have physical sight, but they don't have spiritual sight. They don't see spiritual reality. That means everybody, everybody in this room at some point in time 
from the good guys to the bad guys, everybody, from the nice people to the nasty ones that you meet, everybody has spiritual blindness. That's what Christ talks about, you know, all the time. The blind leading the blind, they'll both fall into a pit. The Bible says everyone is spiritually blind. And so do you begin to understand what it means to be a Christian? What it means to be a Christian, not that you're saved, not, not, not simply that. What it means is that you see, finally. You see! You see for the first time! You actually have sight! Imagine a woman who's been born blind. Never seen color, ever. Never seen light, ever. She is blind. And you tell her about red. You know, the color red. You start talking about how there are all these types of red. There's the maroon, there's the burgundy, there's the light red. There's kind of boring, plain, neutral red. There's all these reds out there. And she begins to say, hmm, okay, red. Is red like the sound that a saxophone makes? Is that red? Is red like the fur of a cat? It's so soft and silky. Is that red? And, and you try to explain it. You say, no, 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 no. That's not red. Red is not like sight. It's not like touch. It's not like hearing. It's not like feeling. Sight is a whole new sense. It's one thing to feel the face of somebody you love. It's another thing to see their smile. You see, what you say to you, this young lady, what you have to say to her, oh, if you only got your sight, you will become aware of all sorts of reality that you're not even aware of right now. But even what you can already experience, you would see in a whole new way. Even that cat that you pet, if you see that cat, you would have a whole new understanding of the cat. Even that person whose face you feel, whose voice you hear, if you can see them once, just as they are, you have a whole new take on them. You know, I, I've seen the videos, maybe you have too, I've seen the videos of what happens when people get their sight for the first time, when they get the hearing aid in, and they can hear for the first time. <laughs> you know what happens, right? When they get their sight, they're always overwhelmed. They're always amazed. They're always transformed. They never say, hmm, this is nice. This is fine. They never say, well, I'm, I'm pretty happy that, that, that I have my sight back, that, that, that I can see for the first time. You know, you have a nine-year-old kid. One of the videos I looked at, you have a nine-year-old kid. He gets a hearing aid for the first time. He breaks down weeping that he can hear his parents talking to him. He doesn't say, huh, okay, okay, interesting. I, I guess I can take it. The point, friends, is that the Bible talks over and over again about salvation as sight for blind people. Sight for the blind. Spiritual sight for the blind. So what is Jesus getting at? What is this text getting at when it shows us blind people needing to see? It shows us that salvation never is simply, Christianity never is simply, well, you know, I know I should be a good person. I know I should go to church. I know I should pray. I know I should get more out of the Bible. I know I should do these things. And so I try to do it a little more. I try to get a little more religion in my life. I try to feel better about myself. I try to have more inspiration. My conscience is a little better. I'm so glad I did this. It's pretty fine. I'm pretty happy I went to church. I feel a little better. That's not Christianity, friends. It's not a matter of turning over a new leaf. A woman who gets sight after having been blind doesn't say, oh, okay, great, what next? No. Look at all the great hymns. They say amazing grace. They don't say halfway decent grace. They say amazing love, not mediocre love. The mark of spiritual sight is that Doctrines you may have intellectually grasped suddenly become heart-rendingly beautiful. That intellectual realities that you may have conceived of become actually dazzling and beautiful to you. Let me give you one acid test, okay? We like to talk about the forgiveness that God brings here. We believe God's a forgiving God. But what if you failed that God? What if you feel guilty about that God? What if you start to get downcast about yourself? Too often the forgiveness of God is an abstraction to us. It's theoretical. We don't see it. 
It never dazzles us. It doesn't lift us up to heaven. It just kind of gives us a little bump, and then we're back down again. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you said, wow, I was a complete moron. How could I be so stupid? I finally get it. All this Christian stuff that I've been around for so many years, I can finally see. You had that. You need to. If you haven't, you need to. You need to have sight. Do you have spiritual sight, friends? Or are you like Elisha's servant who just has been around the prophet for so many years and yet still cannot see? So the first, of course, basic point here is that we're all spiritually blind. And second, and really briefly, we're blind to the real nature of sin. We're blind spiritually to what sin really is. The real nature of sin is not simply, if, if salvation is getting sight, then the real nature of sin is not simply a little bit of uh, imperfect vision. You know, I have to go to the eye doctor very often, and they have to give me, you know, new prescriptions. They have to do all the little tests with the little lenses, and they say one and two and two and three and three and four and 20 and 30, and I don't know which one's better, which one's worse. That's not the nature. The, the nature of sin is not simply the difference between one and two on the lens chart. The nature of sin is blindness. That means it's not trusting the goodness of God. You have this wicked Syrian army. You have this servant of God. What do they have in common? Look at the servant. Look at what he says. Alas, my master, what shall we do? What is he thinking there? He's thinking God's abandoned him. He's thinking that God actually is not here. He's not for us. He's not with us. That's sin. That's doubting the goodness of God. It's not seeing the goodness of God. Now look at the Syrians. What do they think? They think God's not there. We can defeat this God. We can defeat his prophet. If we capture this guy, Elisha, we'll be free. And then we'll, we'll be a, a mighty empire. We'll conquer and we'll enlarge our land. The point is, sin's not just the action of trying to get Elisha. Sin's not just the, the, the doubt. Sin is the attitude of the heart that says, God's not there. God's really not with me and for me in this moment. When you begin to see that, you begin to see that spiritual blindness is actually very deadly and very common. But thirdly, and this is where we'll camp out for a bit, we are particularly blind to the man we need to find, the man we need to see. Look at verse 18. The Syrians are coming against him. Elisha prays to the Lord. He says, please strike the people with blindness. So they get blind. And then verse 19, Elisha says to them, oh, this is the wrong way. This is not the way. This is not the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. I'll show you the way. I'll show you the guy you're looking for. Now let's think about this for a second, okay? When the Syrians are struck blind, what would make them want to follow Elisha? When the Syrians are struck blind, I mean, if you're struck blind, you would say, I, I can't see. Help, I, I can't see. That's what I would say. I, I think you'd say something similar, right? If you're actually blind. Now, why would Elisha say, follow me in that instance? If they're saying, I'm blind, I'm blind, and Elisha says, follow me, why would they follow him? How could they follow him? And why would Elisha even need to argue? Well, if they're all blind, why couldn't Elisha just go away? Why couldn't he just flee? Why did he do all this rigmarole about, well, this is not the way, this is not the city, follow me, I'll take you to the guy you, you need to see. Why did he do all this? Well, what, what's so interesting is, and this is what some of the commentators point out, is that the folks, these Syrians, they could not really tell what they're looking at. It's not that they're blind like total darkness blindness. It's that the perception of their world is distorted. If they really had known they were blind, they would have said, wow, I'm blind. I can't see. But the point is that God strikes them with a blindness that distorts their perception so they cannot see what's in front of them. They cannot tell what's there. And Elisha says, follow me. 
and because they did not know where they were, they were completely vulnerable. Do you see that? They're completely docile. They're like sheep, like the, the rats, the mice following the Pied Piper. Elisha marches them right into Samaria. He marches them right into Samaria. They're outnumbered by the force of Israel. And Elisha leads them to the king of Israel. But did you notice that he kind of lies about it, right? He says in verse 19, I'm going to bring you to the guy you seek. Well, who are they seeking? They're looking for Elisha. He's right there. I mean, it's kind of funny. He said, I'm going to take you to the guy you want. And I'm the actual guy you want. Now, is Elisha lying there? Well, in one vantage point, yes, he is. But if somebody's coming after you in battle, they're coming after you, they're going to kill you. You're allowed to juke fake right and go left. You're allowed to deceive. But in another sense, Elisha actually isn't lying. He's saying, you guys are looking for somebody. I'm going to take him to you. You're not going to find him. Not here. Who are they looking for? They're looking for the one who is going to free them, who is going to bring them from victory to victory. They're looking for the conqueror. They're looking for the one who's going to end the war because they figured once we get Elisha, we can just march right on through and dominate. They're looking for a savior, a liberator. Only in Samaria, only when they come to the king of Israel, do they realize, I can't defeat this God. This God of Israel is way more powerful than we thought. This is a God who is so majestic. He is so powerful that we can't defeat him. And Elisha shows them only in Samaria when the king of Israel comes out. He shows them and he shows us. And he shows the king of Israel what blindness and sight actually look like. Did you see the king of Israel's response here? Verse 21. It's a, it's a weird response, isn't it? The king of Israel saw them. You can, right when he sees them, he's like a little boy, you know. He, he says to Elisha, my father, a prophet, can I kill them? Can I really kill them now, please? You can imagine he has them by one of their by the hair. He's just like at the sword there. Like, can, can I please kill them? Can I just, just wipe them out, please? And look at what Elisha says. No. No. Verse 22. Would you strike down those whom you have taken captive? The Lord captured them. God captured them. And so what's fascinating here is that Elisha shows the Syrians that they're blind by taking them to the king who judges, who wants to kill them, to the judgment seat of Israel. The king is the judge. He wants to kill them. And yet, what does Elisha say? No. Mercy. No. Mercy. He says, verse 23, prepare for them, accept bread and water before them that they may eat and drink. But the king doesn't give them like, you know, prison rations. He gives them a great feast. He prepares for them a great feast. What is that? Friends, that's the gospel right there. He prepares for these enemies of God a feast like brothers. Treat them as those we love. Forgive the people who are coming after you. Feast and embrace the people that don't believe like you. He wants to give them sight. He wants to transform these folks' hearts. How are you and I going to be like that with our enemies? I mean, we're called to love our enemies, aren't we? How are you and I going to be like that with the the enemies that you face, that I face, that we face? Well, you have to know a couple of things. First, you have to know know the angels are there. You have to know the chariots are there. You have to know the protection of the chariots. There were two people in the history of Israel who got into bad spots in Dothan. One of them, of course, is Elisha. He's about to be killed, but he prays. He cries out to God. But did you know that a few hundred years before this, Joseph was also in Dothan, Joseph the patriarch. What happens to him in Dothan? His brothers take him. They put him into a pit in Dothan, and they sell him into slavery. Like Elisha, he cries out. Like Elisha, the man of God, Joseph prays to God, but he doesn't get saved. The angels don't come rescue him. He's sold into slavery. 
And you say, well, that's pretty awful. The chariot saved Elisha. They didn't save Joseph. But of course, when you read the whole story, you know that if Joseph had been saved at that moment, all of his family would have died in the famine. And Joseph himself was on a road for spiritual blindness. He was proud. He was incredibly proud. He was being ruined by his father's favoritism. If he hadn't been sold into slavery, if the angels had come, the chariots of fire had come and saved him and lifted him up out of the great pit, the great well, he would never have become a great man spiritually. He would never have been able to save his family from famine. You see that? The chariots were there. The chariots were there. God was always there. Isn't that what Joseph says in Genesis 50, 50 verse 20? That what you plan for good, God, what you plan for evil, God meant for good. God was always there. The chariots of fire were always there. They just had their mufflers on. They just had their talenters on. They were always there. And the chariots, if you're a Christian, they're always around you. Even when you've been struck. Even when you're going through the wilderness. Even when it looks like you're in the valley of the shadow of death. God is not against you. He's trying to change your heart through grace. You can trust Him in the dark place. You can trust Him in trouble. You can trust Him with your neighbors, whether they're Syrians or not. You can feast with them as brothers and sisters. And the only way you'll be able to do that is if you have the spiritual sight to know they're there. If you have the spiritual sight to know they're there. But second, if you want to be like Elisha, if you want to have that spiritual sight, You don't just need to know the angels are present. You also need to know that you have to respect the people who aren't Christians. You've got to respect the people who aren't Christians. Look at Elisha. The Israelites are amazed here. They're they're stunned here. The Syrians come into their very capital city. They eat and drink, and they go away, and they're fine. So do you accept? Do you embrace? Do you lavish with joy? Do you lavish with mercy? Do you lavish with acceptance all sorts of people who differ with really different views on everything, spiritually, culturally, religiously, people who actually historically have been your enemies? Can you be like that? It's very hard to be like that. How how can we be like that? We have to remember that there was another one like Elisha, Right? There was another one like Elisha. He was a prophet. He was surrounded by his enemies. They came after him. One of his servants freaked out. One of his servants drew a sword. He began to wield it. And Jesus Christ said to his servant Peter, Peter, put away your sword. Put away your sword. Because Jesus knew there were two ways to end the war between Satan and himself. Just like there were two ways to end this war between Israel and Syria. They could have just killed the Syrians. They could have killed the Syrians. They could have cut them. The king of Israel could have just cut them their heads off. Or he could have changed their hearts with grace and love. And that's the path that Elisha showed. And that's the path that Christ showed. Christ says, don't you know, Peter? Don't you know that if I wanted to, I could call down 12 legions of angels? I could have the chariots of fire. I could have the army of angels. He's thinking of the chariots right there. He's thinking of the angelic army because he knows in the history of the Bible, every other prophet in a great trial surrounded by enemies gets saved. But here's what Christ said to Peter. Peter, I did not come to be saved by the chariots of fire. I came to be abandoned by them. I came to be abandoned by the chariots of fire. The only reason you can be sure as a Christian that the chariots of fire won't abandon you, that the angels won't abandon you. The only reason you can know that God wants to feast with you and not stab you like the king of Israel did is because there was one who took what you deserved. He took that slaughter. There was one who came and had the chariots of fire abandon him. When the foes came after him, when the Pharisees came after him, when the Jews put him on that cross, when Pilate agreed to it cowardly, when he was beaten, when he was bruised, when he was stricken, his enemies were not struck blind. The darkness didn't come on Pilate and the Pharisees. It came on him. It came down on him. And that's why, friends, you have to, if you want to be somebody who can see, if you want to be somebody who can see, You have to let God capture you. 
You have to let God make you His slave and He be your master because He is the only master who frees you. He is the only master who gives you food and water. He is the only master who doesn't just give you food and water. He gives you a feast. He is the only one who melts your hearts and He will not punish you because He punished one who came and took that slaughter in your place. That's the God you serve. And that's why, friends, you can pray to this God with your axe head problems. You can trust Him with the chariot problems, all the problems, all the time, because that's your God. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank You that You are a God we can come to, that You are a God who has taken not just the fire, not just the sin, but You've taken the darkness, You've taken the shame, that we might be yours and yours alone. Help us to see, Lord. Give us that sight we pray for. Give us that sight of heaven we long for, that we might not be blind to what real reality is like, that we may see what truly matters and so live and love like it all of our days. We come to you in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Let me ask that you for us to stand up and close our service here by singing our closing song, 642, Be Thou My Vision. people of God. Look up now and receive your Lord's great chariot blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen.